Okay. Um, welcome to all of you for um, for turning up tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, and also, um, before I say a few words about who I am, thank you to Tarsa for this uh, wonderful opportunity for a public lecture on what I'm sure we all agree is a very important, significant um, issue in health and healthcare. I'm Professor John Adams. I'm not Alex Broom, so uh, you'll be thankful for that. Um, I'm Professor of Public Health at University of Technology Sydney, here in the city, um, and um, it's my honour to um, be your MC for tonight and to facilitate not only this lecture, but also um, a panel discussion a little later, and also we're looking to have some interaction with you. We don't want you just to be here listening. It would be nice if you've got some questions for a Q&A session a little later too. Um, so just very, very briefly first, um, it's my um, honour to introduce Associate Professor Alex Broom. Um, I've known Alex for about 15 years now. We've worked together for a long time. I could tell you many things about him, but I'll keep it short. Um, he's smirking now because he's happy. Um, so Alex is an Associate Professor of Sociology at University of Queensland. He's also Head of Sociology at University of Queensland, and he's an ARC Future Fellow. Um, Alex is interested in many healthcare issues in terms of applying sociological thinking, social science methodology, and he's also heading a very interesting and exciting program on tonight's topic using sociological perspectives and fieldwork. Um, tonight Alex is going to tell us a little more about that program. He's going to tell us about the sociological approach to antibiotics. Um, I think without further ado, I'll let Alex say a few more words. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks, John, for that introduction, and uh, thank you for uh, coming out this evening. Um, it's getting pretty late, and I hope we're feeling well lubricated after the, the first half hour. Um, I'd like to also say thanks to Tarza for supporting this event. Um, it's great to have uh, public lectures um, and to sort of engage a whole range of different disciplines um, and also members of the public in the issues that we're researching. Um, I would, there will be an opportunity, as John said, um, for questions um, and for our panel, as well as myself, um, to take questions on whatever issues might come up over the next hour or so. Um, we'd like it to be interactive and um, we'll be pleased for your input and um, we'll have some roaming mics or people roaming with mics uh, in order to take questions um, later. So I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land uh, which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past and present. My talk today is about the uh, past, present and future of antibiotics and I think without an appreciation of these, um, we don't really get the full picture. Um, so I'm going to try and sort of uh, interrogate or some memories of the past, um, some current issues, but also uh, paint a picture of where we might be getting uh, as a society or societies. Um, when my grandmother was born, uh, there were no antibiotics. Um, had she got what we would now consider to be a minor infection, um, her chance of survival uh, would be significantly less than it is for us now. By the time I'm retirement age, and to be honest that's not that soon, hopefully, um, it is likely that I'll be in much the same situation that my grandmother was in terms of antibiotic options. Uh, it will be a situation of, um, as someone said to me recently, wait and watch whether you live or die, which was actually very comforting to be honest. Um, we'll be able to do a few things. Um, uh, clinically, you'll see the removal um, of infected areas of the body, if you can remove them. Um, we'll see the draining of fluid, and we'll see the waiting for nature to take its course. That whole waiting for nature to take its course narrative uh, is, is, sounds better than it is, because nature often kills us. So, basically, if things progress as they are now, um, we are going to, particularly in terms of antimicrobial resistance, resistance will proliferate, we know that, uh, and we're going to experience what can only be described as an antimicrobial perfect storm. 
diminishing resources and increasing resistance. Um, I think, and, and uh, I think it's worth remembering that antimicrobial resistance is actually a natural evolutionary phenomenon. Um, it's not unnatural. And uh, when microorganisms are exposed uh, to an antimicrobial, um, more susceptible organisms succumb, leaving those behind resistant to the antimicrobial. And of course, they pass off uh, this resistance to their offspring. And that is an entirely normal process. The problem is, and I guess this is the point of the talk today, is that this process is speeding up. Um, we're seeing a serious acceleration um, of antimicrobial resistance of a normal evolutionary process that's being turned into a not so normal uh, human driven process. So the main drivers of antimicrobial resistance um, are as follows. Um, the inappropriate use of medicines and antibiotics, which clearly is going to be uh, an emphasis today. The overuse, underuse and misuse of antibiotics. The second one is sub-therapeutic doses um, of antibiotics, which is a common one, and we see that in livestock um, quite a lot as well. That also leads to resistant organisms. Poor infection prevention and control, um, amplifying resistance, and a really important one, um, and I'm going to talk a bit about this later on in terms of the politics of this, is the pipeline of antibiotics is drying up. Uh, we simply are not seeing the development of new options. And when you've got increasing resistance and decreasing emergence of options, you've got a serious problem. So I don't want to give a, a history lesson today, and nor am I a historian of medicine, and therefore it wouldn't exactly be my place to do so. I think in thinking about antibiotics, to consider the history and to reflect for a moment on um, some historical trends is useful. I think it's probably useful because it might be a case of back then is what we are going to see very soon. Um, you know, uh, I, want to, I want to show you some <laughs> images of the, the medicine of the past. Um, I guess what I might call the infection control of yesteryear. Um, and you might think this is, uh, this is a touch dramatic. Um, you know, this, the, the stuff of the dark ages. Um, but I think it actually gives quite good insight into what may be ahead of us. Um, it it is, does always um, intrigue me that these sort of images always have strange looking men in wigs doing things, <laughs> looking really unconvincing. Um, I, I, feel like, I feel like the taking of that leap might not work. I don't know about you. Uh, anyway, they are going to try no matter what. So, you know, and, and I think that um, anyone who's studied medicine or, or the history of medicine, or anyone interested in medicine for that matter, will, will kind of remember these types of images. You know, it's, it's a really laughable situation in this golden era of uh, antibiotics, you know. I actually remember thinking as a child, um, how could, you know, medicine be so brutal, if you can call this medicine. Um, looks more like engineering to me. Um, and, you know, I think how can options be so crude? Uh, I'm sure I didn't know actually the word crude when I was young, but, to, you know, you get the point. And I think um, most of us still think how can an infection um, kill, or a simple infection kill? How can bacteria be so powerful? And um, one of the themes running through, I guess, my work and, and the talk today is we're probably headed over bacteria for some time now, and probably for as long as a lot of us can remember. Um, but they're back, and uh, back with a vengeance. <laughs> and I think it's, it's not unreasonable to suggest that um, bacterial infections may actually be the plague of the next few generations. Um, and it's quite scary because this is actually already the case. It's not a matter of this is in the future, it's actually happening now. And I want to give, uh, sort of skip hundreds of years into the future, well, current situation. And I want to um, uh, give you a case study or a scenario to sort of illustrate um, what I'm talking about. So six months ago, William, uh, a 66-year-old Queensland man with diabetes, uh, stepped on a nail in his backyard. Something actually, um, I've done uh, several times growing up, and I'm sure some of you will have done it as well. 
And I want to give you a warning. I have to uh, pass these slides um, past uh, a particular person in the audience who said, I think you might need to give a warning before you show these. So anyone who's got a, uh, uh, you know, a weak stomach should, um, I don't know, work on not having a weak stomach and watch. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, that wasn't a very good warning, was it? Um, but I do think this gives us sort of an understanding of uh, where we're heading. So, okay, it gets worse. <laughs> um, now, William presented to hospital um, with his foot looking a bit off. I know doctors in the audience might think it's an adequate description. I suppose a bit off is not really technically right, but not terrible. Um, the infection, as it turns out, was MRSA. Um, a multi-resistant bacterial infection. And this is day one on presentation to hospital. After initial period on IV antibiotics, he was put on the only available oral antibiotic and he couldn't tolerate it due to diarrhea. That was the weak stomach, people. The treating team subsequently decided uh, to remove his toe um, in an attempt to remove the source of infection. Uh, and the amputation of the, the toe was unsuccessful in controlling the infection. And this is, and I, I joked before, but this is a very serious situation. Um, and it gets more serious. He then required a below-the-knee amputation. Um, he's currently in uh, rehabilitation um, and um, was uh, benevolently consented to us, us using these uh, slides today, um, so we're thankful for that. And you can see the outcomes of this, you know, seemingly I mean, minor event, um, standing on a nail in one's backyard, and, you know, I, I really do think this could happen to any of us, and, um, it, you know, you may think it's a bit dramatic, but actually it's not. If you look at the latest research on multi-resistant um, uh, multi-resistant related deaths, just in the states alone, we're seeing 23,000 in the last year from resistant organisms. That's deaths. In Australia, we see around 8,000 people die every year from bacterial infections, which is about 160 people a week. Um, that's predicted to double uh, by 2030. And um, if you put into that equation, the issue of antimicrobials, then the situation becomes pretty concerning. And of course there are ripple effects here. It's actually not just about someone presenting with an infection. What we're looking at here, with the amplification of resistance and diminishing antibiotic resources, is that the mainstay of medical procedures around cancer chemotherapy um, or surgery will become seriously risky because of the lack of antibiotic options available or because of resistant organisms. <coughs> simple procedures that, well they're not really simple, I mean a good example would be a hip transplant, um, which are very effective in increasing quality and quantity of life um, and could be very much considered life-saving um, uh, uh, sort of um, procedures, <coughs> will become seriously risky. The actual risk profile of a whole range of different medical procedures will change um, because of the infective implications um, of, of embarking on those um, uh, treatments. So basically, uh, doctors and uh, health service providers will have to think twice about the things that we take for granted. Uh, is it worthwhile? And of course, um, in situations where infections um, are present, there'll be a focus on cleaning wounds, applying topical antiseptics, uh, or removing the whole limb if possible, which is like this scenario here. Okay, so now I want to step back in time. Um, I want to go a few years back, quite a few years back actually. It's the golden years uh, of antibiotics and uh, antibiotic development. Um, Alexander Fleming uh, and colleagues were the unintended discoverers, as I'm sure you all know, of, uh, of, of penicillin, the petri dish kind of accident which, uh, which produced this amazing 
um, way of, uh, of treating infections. And it was a, truly a, a revolutionary kind of game changer of, of modern medicine. And uh, I, I think it's, it's interesting because Fleming's the one that's always sort of held up in lights uh, when it comes to uh, antibiotics, but actually he wasn't alone. And it was a complex kind of process. Andrew Moyer, the American microbiologist, perfected a method of mass production in the US. Howard Florey, the Australian pharmacologist, developed um, a powdery form of the medicine. Um, and Ernest Chain, the German-born biochemist, assisted Florey in, in developing that as well. A less known fact, although, you know, uh, it, it may be known by some of you here, Australia was the first country that had um, penicillin, or made penicillin available to civilians. So this was radical in terms of what it did um, at, at the time. Uh, it dealt with the major killers, including strep throat, pneumonia, sepsis and childbirth, <coughs> meningitis, and you know, many, many other conditions. And it also helped with a really serious problem of the, of the time. Deaths from infections um, in the context of warfare were huge. And this really shaped the cultural impact of penicillin. It was really interesting because um, at the time, what you saw in the US was huge investment in penicillin producing factories, something that you would never see today in terms of um, there being very little consideration of cost. It was, we need penicillin, we need it produced, um, and it's part of the war effort, um, get going. And so what you saw is this sort of, um, huge uh, development and rollout of, uh, of penicillin and antibiotics more broadly. So it dealt with, and in, in terms of the public sort of reception of antibiotics and penicillin in particular, it was seen as kind of the saving grace and it was seen as um, completely changing the risks of warfare. It, was a, it, also, it also dealt with some of the more questionable activities uh, of, the, uh, of the soldiers. <laughs> Uh, it says, private caution says, watch your step, soldier. Um, guard against syphilis and gonorrhea. So it wasn't, uh, it, was, it was quickly becoming the sort of part of the uh, public and the a private, or solution to the public and the private problems of a generation or two. So that was the sort of um, golden years, I guess you could say. And I'm sorry if this is uh, sort of um, a little bit small, but um, there was quite significant activity in, in terms of this timeline. Um, we didn't have long at all until, until we saw the rise of antimicrobial resistance. And again, useful to remember, antimicrobial resistance existed a long time before antibiotics. Um, there are actually... Um, bacteria resistant to antibiotics that were discovered uh, or have been discovered in glaciers that we know are over or two thousand around about two thousand years old um, so it really isn't that resistance is not natural um, it's that resistance is now driven by human activities and overuse um, or misuse of antibiotics and what this has done is it's created a dynamic of or a situation of selective pressure a process that enables resistant strains to thrive and spread easily. So, for me, it's it's um, it's curious why resistance sort of comes as a huge surprise um, uh, to some, at least to some stakeholders. Um, if we actually go back to Alexander Fleming's Nobel Prize speech, he said, and I quote: "It is not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory." by exposing them to concentrations not sufficient to kill them. There is a danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. Um, and apologies for the sexist language of the time. But um, I think that it's really interesting that Fleming was all, you know, already aware of the natural process of resistance and the potential for accelerated resistance if people dealt with penicillin um, in problematic ways. He probably didn't realise that the ignorant man would turn out to be an ignorant world. Um, and 
you know, where we would throw antibiotics around um, to the point where resistance would occur extremely quickly. So from the, the timeline that I've uh, put here, which is um, unfortunately slightly um, small, um, you know, we can see the very quick development of resistance post the discovery of each antibiotic. Um, Fleming's prediction was correct, and it, and it was correct for discoveries of antibiotics um, subsequent. Penicillin resistance staph emerged in the 1940s, while it was still only being given to um, a few patients. Tetracycline introduced in the 1950s, and tetracycline resistant Shigella emerged in 1959. And, the, and it continues um, through each discovery. What happened was antibiotics became much more affordable, um, and as their use increased in the population, people had greater access to them, bacteria developed defences more quickly. Now, a not well-known fact is that antibiotics cost approximately $1 billion per drug to develop. That's the, the broad estimate. Now, one of the problematic dynamics with the development of antibiotics is the level of pharmaceutical interest in this process. Of course, you know, you know, you'll know that antibiotics get given um, in uh, uh, short periods of, or bursts of, uh, um, uh, to a patient. So rather than being, let's say, um, consumed by the chronically ill, the return from a pharmaceutical investment um, is relatively limited. Therefore, we see a uh, lack of willingness um, to actually invest in antibiotics from the pharmaceutical community. So as usual, money is part of the problem. And of course, when money is involved, some win, some lose. What we see here um, is one example of the geopolitics of resistance. The kind of uh, proliferation of resistant organisms across time, um, or oh, sorry, across space and across borders. And you can see that, uh, I mean, you know, it, this is just one, one particular example of um, penicillin resistant um, gonorrhea. But you can see that it adversely, um, uh, or it has presence and adversely affects poorer countries. And, you know, I, and, um, I was actually having a conversation with uh, Jennifer about this recently. One can only imagine what border control strategies would be put in place in a post-antibiotic era. I mean, given the fact they're already concerned, and this is being filmed, so I shouldn't say anything negative about uh, politics in Australia and border control issues. <laughs> Must not talk about that, not the topic. Um, is what would actually happen if we had justification to um, actually prevent um, migration because of the high rates of resistant organisms in particular countries. And you can already see the greater presence of resistant organisms in developing countries. So just throw that in the mix and think about um, the implications. So what I'm really actually saying in, in, in a very kind of uh, uh, brief way is that we have really diminishing resources and we have a situation of the proliferation of resistance. Now I'm going to uh, answer that phone <laughs> and put my sociological cap on. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the social dimensions of the problem. I want to focus on use of antibiotics. Um, and I think of the three strategies um, outlined by the World Health, World Health Organization to combat resistance, working towards more judicious use um, is probably the most realistic, or perhaps it's just the most that I'm relevant to, but I suspect it's a combination. And I would argue that the current situation with antibiotics in terms of misuse, um, underuse, overuse, um, is actually a social and cultural issue. It's as well as a health service issue, and, and that's really what I want to um, present to you today. What I, and I, I'm, in, I'm particularly interested in um, the hospital context, and, um, and I think we'll have a really quite lively panel discussion after this. And what I want to make is a broader argument about antibiotics are used 
within a particular social world. And that antibiotics use um, is, or is strongly mediated by interpersonal relationships and social ties. There are, and I think that captures it in, in my um, attempt to sort of um, create a diagrammatic um, understanding of it, that there are stronger and there are weak ties. And the tendency has been to focus in on doctors um, in terms of the prescribers, but actually there are a whole range of influences um, within the social world that influence a whole range of influences on antibiotic usage. And um, yeah, doctors may be standing or those standing represented by those standing closest, um, but others include our social networks, politicians, and we'll hear more about this as I continue this talk today, big pharma, mass media and many other stakeholders who influence how, why and when antibiotics are used. In this sense, I'm going to argue that antibiotics can be seen as just as much a, a social problem as a medical problem or as a matter of control over medical work uh, or control over drugs for that matter. It's also a political problem. Um, and one that stems from what I would say, and it has parallels with climate change, a preparedness to um, make short-term, um, or take short-term pain to actually achieve long-term gains. And I just don't think our, po our politicians necessarily have the stomach for it. Maybe the public don't either to some extent, and I think that's a, that's a broader discussion that we can have, and potentially after this talk as well. I think we also have really poor memories of the past, and I think, um, and that's partially why I went into some of the history of, um, of antibiotics today, that we are operating or have lived, and I guess I speak for myself in some ways here, in an era of fix-it medicine. Um, we've, you know, kind of drunk the elixir of biomedical development, um, and we see everything as, and um, Again, not everyone sees it this way, but I think there is a tendency toward um, thinking about um, uh, biomedicine as so being able to solve anything. And many GPs will say, and this is in our research as well, as hospital specialists will say, it's just easier to give them a script because they want something. They want you to intervene and fix it for them. So. So moving back to the question of social forces and, and, and antibiotics as operating within a social world, how do antibiotics make their way into an individual's body um, and what social forces influence this? I want to unpack this today. What are the interpersonal, structural, political and economic um, kind of dynamics in there? Um, I want to sort of preface this with you know, there are certain situations where antibiotics are very clearly needed. If you look at issues around bacterial meningitis, um, pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, septic shock, it's a no-brainer. There is no question here that there are certain scenarios where antibiotics are extremely important. But there are many other scenarios in which there are pressures, drivers, dynamics that actually push people towards receiving or providing antibiotics that we actually need to reveal and we actually need to talk about. It's actually often interpersonal relationships and social ties that result, result in use of antibiotics. This is a, a, a slight shift, but I want to briefly talk about community attitudes towards antibiotics. What do, what do lay people, in inverted commas, and I'll consider myself a lay person in this context as well. I'm not a, a doctor. What you know? What are the community, or how do the community actually view or receive antibiotics? And you know, this is actually a really polarised and, and mixed bag. Um, patients and their families often show uh, a strong desire for action. Um, for antibiotic scripts when they get ill. It's well documented. The research shows significant pressure from the majority of people when they're presenting to, um, for example, general practice clinics and even in hospital when they get ill. But there's also, and this is quite intriguing, a resistance movement. Um, you know, excuse the pun. Um, it's, it's sort of the view of 
antibiotics as the medical miracle of the 21st century, or 20th century, sorry, um, has actually shifted slightly. And it's what I would call this kind of, and, and you'll be aware of it anyway, um, antibiotic scepticism. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have taken your cult or um, a kind of uh, uh, health plus and implicitly or explicitly engaged in uh, debates around good bugs, bad bugs. Um, I, I was tempted to end that sentence with bed bugs, but it's absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, and bodies, you know, the body's natural balance. Um, and, you know, and I think what this is, is, is a sort of a post unreflective years of antibiotics. It's the sort of emergence of a community based scepticism towards what antibiotics do to us. And, and um, part of this is about um, antibiotics as um, altering the bacterial balance of the body and not always in good ways. So within the community and also within the scientific community as well, we've seen these sort of logics or, um, emerging around resistance um, to antibiotics, not antibiotic resistance. I realise that I'm playing with these words here in, in potentially problematic ways. Um, and many of, uh, in, many of these logics are tied to um, a sort of a broader resistance to biomedicine, the idea of good bacteria and a growing interest in uh, holistic health. Uh, which is another area which um, myself and my colleagues have been quite interested in as well. Harnessing the body's natural healing properties. What was then really interesting is we saw the commercialization of good bacteria, or the commodification of good bacteria, the kind of industry of holistic health and how it co-opted or um, it sort of encompassed, or however you want to talk about it, the antibiotic scepticism movement. So these kind of community concerns have been enhanced with a growing awareness in the medical community, um, and I guess from an epidemiological perspective as well, that actually being exposed to bacteria is important. Um, and what happens in your exposure to antibiotics will have implications long term. Um, an altered microbiome, it would seem, um, has important long term health consequences. And I think a really interesting one is the speculation, um, speculation, that's not really a, a, a good word for it, that sounds like um, I'm speculating, the emerging evidence that um, there's a link between um, babies' exposure to antibiotics and obesity later in life. Another interesting example is the C-section versus the natural birth and the exposure of the child, the baby, to bacteria and the implications across the life course. So there's a kind of an emerging um, awareness both across lay, community and expert um, kind of uh, areas that you know, we really need to think very carefully about um, our sort of bacterial um, engagement, I guess I could say. And I think in some respects this is, this is the right direction. It might, there might be some aspects of it that are misled, but a sort of antibiotics when needed uh, and not when unnecessary, is probably the right way um, to actually move towards judicious use. The problem is, and now I'm going to move to sort of uh, another angle, is that when antibiotics are needed is a highly subjective uh, call, if you like. It's actually not that easy, it's a complex decision. And the reality is, the, the despite the scepticism that I've talked about, within the community, there is a really strong desire from people for antibiotics, and this contributes to the dynamic of, of overuse. Okay, so let's turn to the hospital, um, a context where antibiotic use is extremely high. On any given day in Australia, um, around about 50% of inpatients will be receiving antibiotics at any given time. Um, and this is a, a significant site of potential change because what we can see um, in point prevalence studies um, and in a whole range of studies actually across the uh, sector is that a significant proportion between 20 and 40 percent, even upwards to 48 percent, um, depending on what study you're looking at, are actually inappropriate, suboptimal, incorrect, however you want to, uh, want to articulate that. Okay, 
So let me take the, the hospital as a, as a sort of a case study to examine how antibiotics are a social problem in some respects, not just a clinical, medical or health services problem. Um, there's been lots of work done in the community um, on general practice and actually practices within um, general practice have actually improved quite significantly. What I think is more interesting, more interesting, what I think is particularly interesting is the fact that in hospitals, when you have advanced infectious diseases input, um, you have senior doctors on call, uh, you're, you're really the epicenter of expertise in infectious diseases or antibiotic use, how we have upwards to 50% of antibiotic use being deemed clinically suboptimal, or a nice way of saying major antibiotic fail. Um, and this is only the hospitals that actually provide the data as well. Um, and I'm sure the, the panel will have comments to make about uh, this aspect of my talk uh, afterwards. But, you know, rumour has it, um, well, although we don't like rumour, we've got nothing else, we, uh, we listen to it. Um, private hospitals have. Uh, much worse, worse, mm. much more um, suboptimal practices when it comes to antibiotics. And, um, you know, one reason why you're hearing from a sociologist today rather than someone else is that actually often antibiotic use has been misconstrued, or misuse in hospitals has been misconstrued as just about developing guidelines. Um, it's just about communicating evidence. That will make things better. And in fact, I'm going to argue that actually that's not, that's incorrect. Of course, guidelines are important. Um, but they don't deal with the human, the emotive and the subjective aspects of delivering care to an individual person who may have a fever, who may have an infection, and having to manage that dynamic. Um, now, I just want to um, uh, give a bit of a heads up about some of the people that are involved in this. Um, the observations that I'm going to provide now come from a research program that I developed with uh, Dr. Jennifer Broom, who's over here, um, and Dr. Anna Kirby, um, who also is here and been crucial as well in organising today. I'd also like to mention um, the Sunshine Coast Hospital and Health Service um, in supporting this research program and what we've been doing across Australian hospitals. So what have we been doing? Well, we've been researching the attitudes and perspectives of doctors, pharmacists, nurses, hospital managers um, in Australia and the UK. I recently flew back from, uh, from London um, where we're doing a cross-cultural uh, kind of uh, comparison of what the NHS is doing, or not doing in the case of the NHS at the moment, um, when it comes to uh, antibiotic optimisation. Um, and we sought to really find out, you know, um, what, what are clinicians, what are doctors, pharmacists um, uh, thinking when they're dealing with potential infections, particularly doctors, and what considerations are there in their decisions to use or not use antibiotics? And why aren't the strategies to streamline use working? Uh, and I'm going to move to show you some results from some of the interviews. I'm going to start off with, uh, sorry for the, for the doctor looking sort of, you know, old, white and ridiculous, but it was the only uh, image that I could find on Google Images. So what we have here is uh, a series of uh, interesting themes that emerged from the interviews um, in terms of what was actually going on in these doctors' minds when they were thinking about antibiotics. Now you'd think, well, maybe you wouldn't, that it would be about resistance, optimising antibiotics, that it would be about best practice or clinical guidelines and so forth. But actually what we found was a whole range of interpersonal processes and dynamics that were inflecting or mediating um, their decisions. Um, one of which was benevolence, the act of, um, or what I would call the benevolent role, the immediate care for the patient. I'm just going to do something right now, it's going to be potent, and I'm just going to treat them. I don't want to wait. Um, I've got to do something, it's what doctors do. Uh, responsibility, it, it all lands on me. 
it's my fault if the situation gets worse and I don't want to take the risk of uh, waiting for the micro results to come back, finding out whether it is an infection or what the infection is, I'm going to do something now. Uh, peers, which I think is a very interesting one for a social scientist, which is they all do it, therefore I'm going to do it too. This is the norm within my hospital and I'm going to replicate that because that is what we do. We have a, a sort of a master disciple process of learning. Um, and it continues on with uh, significance. And I think this is one of the really important messages of our research program, but also what I've said thus far. Antibiotics simply are not taken seriously within the social world of the hospital. And because they are not taken seriously, on the balance of risks and implications, they are low. Therefore, um, often they get compromised, thereby feeding into one of the reasons why we can't optimise use. And I'm going to read to you or show you some uh, um, data, some quotes from some of the doctors. I want to premise this by saying this is not critique of the individual doctors. This is about understanding what drives practice. And it's actually about supporting change, um, not about certain people or individuals um, having certain opinions. It's the themes across the interviews. I'm going to have to turn one way or the other to read this out, and I, I'm, I'm sort of torn <laughs> this way. So this is about the sort of benevolent role. I think that probably one of the most powerful influences on prescribing is the doctor-patient relationship, and that feeling of benevolence. Your relationship with your patient is much stronger than your relationship with the microbial ether you've certainly got a much stronger emotional bond, don't you, with that patient. A patient looking at you and saying, why aren't I better? I probably tend to over-treat rather than under-treat. So you can kind of see how um, that, that logic that goes through that narrative of, well, you know, I'm, it's benevolence, it's my responsibility, and therefore I am going to treat and I am going to over-treat. So you can see how that logic makes sense on some immediate level. Of course, it doesn't make sense when in 20 years you don't have anything to treat them with. There was also an interesting sort of relationship between this rationalisation of, uh, of over-treating and risk reduction. I'm going to read you out a couple more uh, interview quotes. I probably tend to over-treat rather than under-treat. And I said, why is that? <laughs> oh, fear of relapse and the uncertainty that they're going to get better. And actually lack of evidence-based knowledge myself. Safety for us is not making a mistake, not missing something, where a patient has a bad outcome. Misprescribing is more of a broader issue. Uh, the next respondent says, again, a doctor, not a junior doctor actually, I don't want to prescribe the wrong thing and look stupid. I don't want to prescribe something that might have bad interactions and look dangerous. Every decision is plagued with this possibility that you're being dangerous. We err between passive stupidity and dangerous. Passive and stupid when we're not making decisions, and dangerous when we do. So you can see how the sort of the risk lands on the individual doctor there, and how how could you reasonably expect, particularly someone who's just learning to doctor, them to take on risk in this context, which might be watching and waiting while we see whether an infection develops, or waiting until the um, the morning, uh, for example, if you're just on a night shift by yourself to talk to the consultant. Another um, interesting um, uh, sort of uh, theme within it is the issue of reputation. I think junior doctors, they feel that they should know the difference and they don't ask. They save up the arse for the really big things, not antibiotics. So you can also see in there that two things going on. One is the prioritisation or lack thereof of antibiotics. Um, the second one is the development of a medical ro or, uh, competence in medicine. Um, you want to create a, a, a dynamic where you look competent and uh, you don't ask for help unnecessarily. And therefore that cultural expectation of not actually um, uh, asking for things that don't matter links again to the prioritisation of antibiotics within the hospital. <coughs> 
Another one is, or another theme is uh, peer-related practice. And excuse the jargon here, I hope this is clear. So I think people who would do a third or fourth degree vaginal tear while that consultant or senior doctor was on duty would undertake antibiotic prescribing according to that consultant's practice. And if you were to see a patient outside of that consultant's duty day, you would do what the other consultant normally does. So you can see there that there's an adaptive situation occurring for the junior doctors, that it's not actually about what is the best practice to do, it is about what am I told to do by the senior consultant on any given day? So you can see how that influence would significantly get in the way of streamlining and optimising prescribing if you had a situation where the consultant wasn't up to date or wanted something different from what was best practice. Of course, that would never happen. But this is the big one, really, I think. The marginality of antibiotics. No, antibiotics, it's a peripheral thing. I think, to be honest, it's a peripheral thing. You don't go read up. I don't memorise antibiotic guidelines. I don't bother reading up what's new in the last 12 months. Only when patients have allergies do you ever bring up antibiotic guidelines. So I, I, I don't sort of make any judgments about this. I think it's actually really useful having people being truthful in interviews and, and, and illustrating a wider system problem. I don't believe this is about a bad doctor um, I don't know, that's not what I'm assessing. What is interesting is how the marginal status of antibiotics gets absorbed into the psyche and the roles of doctors within the hospital. So, I almost skipped ahead of myself there. Um, you can see how um, our research has sort of, sort of interrogated the interpersonal and the social dynamics around antibiotics and, and the fact that it's not just about best practice, it's about hierarchies, Priorities, fear of senior colleagues, desire to submit to local norms of practice, and the emotions of simply wanting to do everything. And I think it's you know important to remember that doctors are not the only agents in this social world. Um, you know, enter the pharmacist, uh, then we get a much more complex picture of what the hospital and all the stakeholders are grappling with interpersonally. You know. And despite um, the era of team-based medicine, as George Orwell said, everyone is equal, just some more than others. And you can see this dynamic with pharmacy um, in terms of um, operating within the hospital about antibiotics. So as I mentioned, around about 50% of prescriptions, or actually it's more about 48, according to one study, um, are suboptimal. Now, pharmacists are crucial to picking up Errors, inconsistencies, and problems with antibiotics. Absolutely crucial. And you can see, or we saw in the interviews, the struggle that pharmacists have operating within the hospital system, the social world, with its pressures and interpersonal dynamics. They have what I would say is a very a limited power and influence within the hospital. And I think that their... Um, you know, their power, and, and, to, and you can see the themes up here in terms of what's actually going on with the pharmacists. They're thinking, uh, again, I'm going from one side to the other, um, professional hierarchies, well, you know, even if we interfere, um, ultimately the doctor um, is right and we're going to be considered either wrong or irrelevant. Or the care factor, doesn't really matter. The same thing as the doctors were saying from a pharmacy perspective. Should we, um, uh, should we take up the doctor on the issue of antibiotics or is the other medication or drug issue more important? We're not at the bedside. We only see the scripts and the drugs and actually to be fair a lot of pharmacists are now at the bedside so that was an interesting kind of uh, dynamic and that turns is about resources actually as much as it is the pharmacy role. Um, so I guess um, when we're thinking about um, antibiotics and the use of antibiotics in the hospital, I think we need to think about it as an interprofessional dynamic and one that involves stakeholders with different forms of power and with, I guess, the need to actually appease certain relationships within the hospital. I want to read you out some quotes from uh, the pharmacist that we interviewed. 
Um, I said, of those incorrect antibiotic scripts you pull up, how many would be changed to what you suggest? Well, I guess it's hard because it probably depends. 20 to 30 percent max, maybe. So around two thirds of the advice you give is ignored. Yep. Why is that? Because they think they know more. They don't have time to fix it. By the time they read or come across, they're like, well, they've already had two days of it and it's working. So let's continue it. That's a big one. It's working. And it's not a good reason. And I think that's a, that is a really important um, sort of uh, pharmacy perspective on it. It has to be right, not just working. I think it's hard to go to doctors and say, why are we doing this? And I think it probably needs to come from our whole pharmacy department to create that change. I probably feel that I'm not clinically strong enough to go to a consultant, a senior doctor. So you would always go to the junior doctor, and they don't always know the answer. They're just doing what they're told. I don't think any individual pharmacist is going to change antibiotic prescribing, which again is a very interesting take on it, given the fact that um, pharmacists have very much been a critical part of attempts to govern antibiotics. And they're saying, what can we do? We might know what should happen, and we might know how to correct it, but they don't listen to us. And so you see the limited capacity of pharmacists to actually make a difference in the social world of the hospital. I guess getting doctors to move or change, especially in public, like they don't like to be wrong, and they need the perception of not being wrong. If you're coming along and saying, no, 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 this is what you should be doing, especially on that consultant level, senior doctor level, I say, how do you resolve it if they don't change it? Pharmacists said, I guess you don't. You resolve it in the fact that you've talked to all stakeholders, you've said everything you wanted to say, and it's really in their court. So again, you get this kind of disempowerment of a potential crucial stakeholder in optimising prescribing because of the historical dynamics. So, <clears throat> I guess we get this, uh, you know, while pharmacy might be seen as a major weapon in the fight against antibiotic overuse, my argument would be the actual dynamics within the hospital may actually limit their impact. Um, they may be turning their backs, um, turning a blind eye to antibiotic issues in order to have functioning relationships um, within the hospital. So putting in place stop orders um, and various other, various other pharmacy related strategies, um, uh, uh, you know, it's more complex than just instituting best practice. Pharmacists regularly talk to us throughout our research about being pressured to give drugs without any, uh, without any ID um, or infectious diseases approval. Streamlining use, I would argue, is just as much about relationships and power as it is about education and best practice. I want to now reflect on the broader economic and political climate. Um, well done, everyone, keeping awake thus far. It is, uh, you know, we've taken away the alcohol. I uh, don't know why they did that. I think there's some, there's some rule against it. Can't bring it in. I mean, anyway. Um, so let's move on to some, let, let's move on to hospital managers. It's my favourite types of people. Um, favourite type of interview, interviewees, to be honest, because uh, they really uh, are, are very honest and um, uh, enlightening. And it remains, I think, or, you know, everything I've said thus far um, should be situated within a particular management and political context. And there is no will, there is no way. And I think uh, Nick might have some thoughts on this uh, tonight, um, who's on the panel. And there's an economic context to everything. Um, is that fair to say, no? Excellent. Um, it's always a bit tricky inviting experts along, because then you get all like, hmm, is there really an economic context for everything? But well, I think there is. Um, so one of the most interesting aspects is, uh, for me, was talking to the um, executives. Um, and, you know, we, we, we basically just confronted with them, confronted them with the reality. You're not doing, well not you, the system is not dealing with antibiotics very well. Why? Why, why? why are we not seeing improvements? 
Now, what was really surprising in the interviews was, well, for me, it was how honest they were to start off with. I just couldn't believe that they would say it on tape. And um, how, how sort of dismissive they were of the issues. Not dismissive of, um, of antibiotics, dismissive of its significance um, within the range of other um, things that were confronting them. I'll let the interviews speak for themselves. The hospital manager said to me, we have an obligation to meet the standards, but it's very much a local responsibility. We don't have any reporting responsibilities for antibiotics like we do in other areas. Everything we do, we have KPIs. We have to discuss with our masters. Everything we do, we have to tell them why, and we have to account for it. Things like antibiotics are not part of that discussion at all. Clearly, we prioritise what we need to survive. The conversation continues. Things are tight. And because antibiotics is not something that's used to measure our performance, it's hard to find resources. I said, why is antibiotics not part of your KPIs? Because the government needs to please the voters. And the voters are easily pleased with things the government can easily communicate. KPIs in elective surgery and KPIs in the emergency department are easily communicated. And we easily communicate progress. And when you talk about antibiotics, the average Joe doesn't understand. Antibiotic resistance may make the 10th page. KPIs are the ones that are easily measurable. You cannot have a KPI about who has been correctly prescribed antibiotics because that's subjective. A very resource intensive for us to produce. People don't understand what that KPI means, let alone reporting that to government, who then have to communicate to the public. So the government needs to get re-elected and to have information for them to do that. This is not it. This doesn't even score on the radar. So I was like, okay, it's very honest. The tape's still going there. Um, but I mean, it really does kind of uh, bring up all sorts of, um, of issues and, and maybe we can have this discussion in the panel as well in terms of um, if you don't have a, a, a structural context which demands um, certain outcomes, um, if we don't actually institutionalise judicious use of antibiotics as a KPI, we're not going to go anywhere with this. It is simply not going to happen. There is not, you know, you can talk forever about we're using antibiotics too much um, and no one's going to do anything um, because the system actually needs to support that. I'm getting close to the end. So, I think, um, you know, in sum, um, in terms of the interview data, what we really see is if we're looking at relative influences within the social world of the hospital, you know, we've really got decisions about antibiotics being governed less by the factors on your left, and hopefully they're big enough for, for you to read, but essentially it's therapeutic guidelines, evidence, practice some um, kind of uh, development or antimicrobial stewardship and quite significantly more by those factors on the right, uh, the social dynamics, um, the interprofessional, um, the issues of medical identity, habit and norms, legal risk, KPI culture um, and so forth. And I would say actors within the social world of the hospital are actually more concerned in many respects with, with performing and what constitutes appropriate behaviour, for many good reasons, um, within professional hierarchies and managing immediate risks. Again, very understandable, um, this is not about critique of health professionals, it's about how we deliver care, the premises of that, um, and uh, how that might need to change. And I would argue that for practices to change the game, if we're going to talk about it in game terms, and its rules must also change. If doctors prescribing practices um, are governed by peer networks, hierarchies, and the pursuit of benevolence, clini cl ugh, clinically suboptimal prescribing practices will persist. And if pharmacists, pharmacists are held by traditional medical pharmacy relations, um, suboptimal practices will persist. Um, and if executives are not asked to document 
and moderate antibiotics, some optimal practices um, will persist. Um, I think, in, you know, really resistance, because, you know, I started off with, well, I didn't start off with it, but I, you know, at the start of the lecture I talked about resistance. It's not held as a significantly serious risk to actually um, drive practice, as opposed to the more immediate social, um, uh, professional, clinical, um, and economic costs. So basically, in sum, suboptimal antibiotic use is a logical choice within the social world of the hospital. It is simply logical. It makes sense on the ground. The rules of the game are actually um, uh, about the management of immediate risks. And actually, we're only ever going to change practice if we address those norms. Um, so what does this actually tell us about what does it mean for antibiotics and infection management? And, and I'm hoping that you know the panel members will expand on this from from their own fields. I think the good news is this is just a very dire warning from the World Health Organization, which I <coughs> something that looks like something out of the X Files, um, but it's just a very close image of the bacteria. Um, the good news is, I think that norms are changeable, that we can do something about it. Um, and you know, perceptions of risk um, and responsibility can also be addressed if the desire is there. Um, you know, we do have a PR issue. I think that uh, antibiotics are just not taken seriously. They're like the poor cousin, you know, who cares? We'll deal with them later on, but there isn't gonna be anything to deal with later on. Um, I think there are really unrealistic expectations placed on doctors and pharmacists and you could argue executives as well i shouldn't be mean to the executives that's unfair um, that they shouldn't have to make the call of or, or take on all the risk themselves there should be the system structures in place that actually support them to act appropriately and judiciously um, without actually needing to take on those risks themselves and i think we all need to accept some short-term costs for long-term gain. Um, and I think, and this is, uh, this is sort of um, going on to sort of, uh, sort of sociological territory of governance, but I think when we talk about the governance of antibiotics, because a lot of people talk about governance of antibiotics, I would argue actually they're already being governed. Uh, they're being governed by norms, values, hierarchies, rights of passage, KPI culture, managerialism, risk aversion, litigation culture, and, and you know, I'll have to stop it or you won't be able to get your second drink for the evening. So, and I think unpacking and, and revealing uh, and hopefully addressing these core social influences uh, may be the path to reducing unnecessary use of this diminishing resource. Thank you very much. Thank you for those applause. I'm sure you'll join me in once again thanking Alex for such a wonderful and thought-provoking. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, I'm going to wrap up this talk in terms of giving you my reflections on what's been said, but I'd like to do that after the break because for me to talk now for two or even five minutes means you get less chance to take a bit of a break yourself. Um, we're quite aware that sitting here for two hours is fairly demanding of anyone. Um, and also, of course, sitting down is as bad as smoking these days. So you need to be up around and, and, and walking around. So what I'd like to do now is...